The Archaic Symbolism of the World Religions from the Secret Doctrine by H. P. Blavatsky The Lotus as a Universal Symbol There are no ancient symbols without a deep and philosophical meaning attached to them. Their importance and their significance increasing with their antiquity. Such it is with the Lotus. It is the flower sacred to nature and her gods and represents the abstract and the concrete universes, standing as the emblem of the productive powers of both spiritual and physical nature. It was held sacred from the remotest antiquity by the Aryan Hindus, the Egyptians, and the Buddhists after them, revered in China and in Japan, and adopted as a Christian emblem by the Greek and the Latin churches, who made of it a messenger as the Christians do now, who replace it with the water lily. Footnote. In the Christian religion, Gabriel the Archangel is seen holding in his hand a spray of water lilies. He appears to the Virgin Mary in every picture of the Annunciation. This spray, typifying fire and water, or the idea of creation and generation, symbolizes precisely the same idea as that lotus in the hand of the Bodhisattva, who announces to Mahamaya, Gautama's mother, the birth of the world's savior, the Buddha. It had, and it still does have, its mystic meaning, which is identical with every nation on earth. We refer the reader to Sir William Jones. With the Hindus, the lotus is the emblem of the productive power of nature. Through the agency of fire and water, spirit and matter. Quote, eternal, end quote, says the verse in the Bhagavad Gita. Quote, I see Brahm, the creator, enthroned in thee above the lotus, end quote. And Sir William Jones shows, as noted in the stanzas, that the seed of the lotus contains, even before they germinate, perfectly formed leaves, the miniature shapes, of what one day is perfected plants they will become. The lotus in India is the symbol of the prolific earth, and what is more, of Mount Meru. The four angels, or genii, of the four quarters of heaven stand on each a lotus. The lotus is the twofold type of the divine and human hermaphrodite, being of dual sex, so to say. The underlying idea in this symbol is very beautiful, and it shows. Furthermore, it's identical parentage in all the religion systems. Whether in the lotus or the water lily, shape, it signifies one and the same philosophical idea, namely, the emanation of the objective form from the subjective. Divine ideation passing from the abstract into the concrete or the visible form. For as soon as darkness, or rather that which is, quote, darkness, end quote, for ignorance, has disappeared in its own realm of eternal light, leaving behind itself only its divine manifested ideation, the creative logwai having their understanding opened, and they see in the ideal world, hitherto concealed in the divine thought, the archetypal forms of all and proceed to copy and build or fashion upon these model forms, evanescent and transcendent. At this stage of action, the demiurge is not yet the architect. Born in the twilight of action, he has yet to first perceive the plan to realize the ideal forms which lie buried in the bosom of the eternal ideation. As the future lotus leaves, the immaculate petals are concealed within the seed of that plant. In esoteric philosophy, the demiurge, or the logos, regarded as the creator, is simply an abstract term, an idea, like a quote, army, end quote, as the latter is the all-embracing term for a body of active forces or working units, soldiers. So is the demiurge the qualitative compound of a multitude of creators or builders. Vernoff, the great Orientalist, has seized the idea perfectly when saying that Brahma does not create the earth 
any more than the rest of the universe in the following quote. Quote, Having evolved himself from the soul of the world, once separated from the first cause, he evaporates with and emanates all nature out of himself. He does not stand above it, but is mixed up with it. Brahma and the universe form one being, each particle of which is in its essence Brahma himself, who proceeded out of himself. In the Book of the Dead, Chapter 81, it speaks of the ritual called, quote, transformation into the lotus, end quote. A head emerging from this flower, the god exclaims, quote, I am the pure lotus emerging from the luminous one. I carry the messages of Horus. I am the pure lotus which comes from the solar fields, end quote. The lotus idea may be traced even to the Elohistic chapter of the first of Genesis, as is stated in Isis Unveiled. The exoteric and the esoteric. It is in this idea that we must look for the origin and the explanation of the verse in the Jewish cosmogony, which reads, quote, And God said, Let the earth bring forth the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself. End quote. In all the primitive religions, the quote, Son of the Father, end quote, is the creative God i.e. his thoughts made visible and before the Christian era from the Trimurti of the Hindus down to the three Kabbalistic heads of the scriptures as explained by the Jews. The triune Godhead of each nation was fully defined and substantiated into its allegories. Such is the cosmic and ideal significance of this great symbol with the Eastern people. But applied to practical and exoteric worship, which had also its esoteric symbology, the lotus became in time the carrier and the container of a more terrestrial idea. No dogmatic religion has ever escaped this sexual element in it, and to this day it soils the moral beauty of the root idea. Pointing to similar signification was the lotus growing in the waters of the Nile. Its mode of growth was peculiar and fitted as a symbol of the generative activities. The flower of the lotus, which is the bearer of the seed for reproduction as the result of its maturing, is connected by its placenta-like attachment with the mother earth or the womb of Isis. Through the water of the womb, that is, the, nip, the river Nile, by means of the long cord-like stalk called the umbilicus. Nothing can be plainer than the symbol, and to make it perfect in its intended signification, a child is sometimes represented as seated in or issuing from the flower. Thus Osiris and Isis, the children of Kronos, or time without end, in the development of their nature forces, in this picture become the parents of the man under the name Horus. We cannot lay too great stress upon the use of this generative function as a basis for the symbolical language and a scientific art speech. Thought upon the idea leads at once to reflection upon the subject of creative cause. In its workings, nature is observed to have fashioned a wonderful piece of living mechanism governed by an added living soul the life development and history of which soul, as to its whence, its present, and its whither, surpasses all efforts of the human intellect. The newborn is an ever-recurring miracle, an evidence that within the workshop of the womb an intelligent creative power has intervened to fasten a living soul to a physical machine. Footnote. It is the profane of the past ages who have degraded the pure ideal of cosmic creation into an emblem of mere human reproduction and sexual functions. It is the esoteric teachings and the initiates of the future whose mission it is and will be to redeem and ennoble once more the primitive conception 
so sadly profaned by its crude and gross application to exoteric dogmas and personations by theological and ecclesiastical religionists. The silent worship of abstract or the nominal nature, the only divine manifestation is the only one ennobling religion of humanity. And footnote. The amazing wonderfulness of the fact attaches a holy sacredness to all connected with the organs of reproduction as the dwelling and place of evident constructive intervention of deity. This is a correct rendering of the underlying ideas of old, of the purely pantheistic conceptions, impersonal and reverential, of the archaic philosophers of the prehistoric ages. Not so, however, when applied to the sinful humanity, to the gross ideas attached to the personality. Therefore, no pantheistic philosopher would fail to find the remarks that follow the above and which represent the anthropomorphized Judea symbol symbology other than dangerous for the sacredness of the true religion and fitting only our materialistic age, which is in the direct outcome and result of that anthropomorphic character. For this is the key note to the entire spirit and essence of the Old Testament, the symbolism of art speech of the Bible, quote, the locality of the womb is to be taken as the most holy place, the sanctum sanctorium, and the veritable temple of the living God. End quote. Footnote. Surely the words of the old initiate into the primitive mysteries of Christianity, 1 Corinthians 3.16, quote, Know ye not, ye are the temple of God. End quote could not be applied in this sense to men. The meaning may have been, and was so, undeniably in the minds of the Hebrew compilers of the Old Testament. And here is the abyss that lies between the symbolism of the New Testament and the Jewish canon. End footnote. This gulf would have remained and ever widened had not Christianity, especially and most glaringly the Latin church, thrown a bridge over it. Modern popery has now spanned it entirely by its dogma of the two immaculate conceptions and the anthropomorphic and at the same time idolatrous character that is conferred upon the mother of its god. With man, the possession of the woman has always been considered as an essential part of himself to make one out of the two and jealously guarded as sacred. Even the part of the ordinary house or the home consecrated to the dwelling of the wife was called the penetralia, the secret or the sacred, and hence the metaphor of the holy of holies, of sacred constructions taken from the idea of the sacredness of the organs of generation. Carried to the extreme of the description by metaphor, this part of the house is described in the sacred books as, quote, between the thighs of the house, end quote. And sometimes the idea is carried out constructively in the great door openings of the churches placed inward between flanking buttresses. Footnote. It was so carried only in the Hebrew Bible and its servile copyist, the Christian theology. No such thought, quote, carried to the extreme, end quote ever existed among the old primitive Aryans. This is proven by the fact that in the Vedic period, their women were not placed apart from the men in a penetralia or a zinanas, end quote. Their seclusion began when the Mohammedans, the next heirs to the Hebrew symbolism after Christian ecclesiasticism, had conquered the land and gradually enforced their ways and their customs upon the Hindus. The purity of early phallicism. The pre and the post Vedic women were as free as man, and no impure terrestrial thought was ever mixed with religious symbology of the early Aryans. The idea and application are purely Semitic. This is corroborated by the writer of the said intensely learned and Kabbalistic revelation himself, 
when he closes the above quoted passages by adding the following quote, If to these organs as symbols of creative cosmic agencies, the idea of the origin of measures as well as of time periods can be attached, then indeed in the constructions of the temples of dwellings of deity or of Jehovah, that part designated as the Holy of Holies or the most holy place should be borrowed its from it should borrow its title from the recognized sacredness of the generative organs considered as symbols of measures as well as of creative cause. With the ancient wise, there was no name, there was no idea, and no symbol of a first cause. End quote. Most decidedly not. Rather never give a thought to it and leave it forever nameless, as the early pantheists did. It's better than to degrade the sacredness of that idea of ideals by dragging down its symbols into such anthropomorphic forms. Here again, once perceive the immense chasm between Aryan and Semitic religious thought, two opposite poles, sincerity and concealment. With the Brahmins, who have never invested with an, quote, original sin, end quote, element, the natural procreative functions of mankind, it is a religious duty to have a son. A Brahmin, in days of old, having accomplished his mission of human creator, retired to the jungle and passed the rest of his days in religious meditation. He had accomplished his duty to nature as a mortal man and its co-worker, and henceforth gave all his thoughts to the spiritual immortal portion in himself, regarding the, terrest the terrestrial as a mere illusion, an evanescent dream, which it is. With the Semite, it was different. He invented a temptation of flesh in the Garden of Eden, showed his God, esoterically the tempter and the ruler of nature, cursing forever an act which was in logical program of that said nature. Footnote, the same idea is carried out exoterically in the incidents of Egypt. The Lord God tempts sorely Pharaoh and, quote, plagues him with great plagues, end quote, lest the king should escape punishment and thus afford no pretext for one more triumph to his, quote, chosen people, end quote, end of footnote. All this exoterically, as in the cloak and dead letter of Genesis and the rest, and at the same time, esoterically, he regarded the supposed sin and fall of an act so sacred as to choose the organ, the perpetrator of the original sin, as the fittest and the most sacred symbol to represent that God, who is shown as branding its entering into function as disobedience and everlasting sin. Who can ever fathom the paradoxical depths of the Semitic mind? And this paradoxical element, minus its innermost significance, has now passed entirely into Christian theology and dogma. Whether the early fathers of the church knew the esoteric meaning of the Hebrew or the Old Testament, or whether only a few of them were aware of it, while the others remained ignorant of the secret, is for posterity to decide. One thing is certain, at any rate. As the esotericism of the New Testament agrees perfectly with that of the Hebrew Mosaic books, and since, at the time, a number of purely Egyptian symbols and pagan dogmas in general the Trinity, for example, have been copied by and incorporated into the synoptics of St. John, it becomes evident that the identity of those symbols was known to the writers of the New Testament, whoever they may be. They must have been aware also of the priority of the Egyptian esotericism since they have adopted several such symbols that typify purely Egyptian conceptions and beliefs in their outward and in their inward meaning, and which are not to be found in the Jewish canon. One of such is the water lily in the hands of the archangel in the early representations of his appearance to the Virgin Mary. 
and these symbolical images are preserved to this day in the iconography of the Greek and the Roman churches. Thus, water, fire, the cross, as well as the dove, the lamb, and other sacred animals, with all their combinations, yield esoterically an identical meaning and must have been accepted as an improvement upon Judaism pure and simple. For the lotus and water are among the oldest symbols and in their origin are purely Aryan, though they became common properly during the branching off of the fifth race. Let us give example. Letters as much as numbers were all mystic, whether in combination or each taken separately, and the most sacred of all is the letter M. For it is both feminine and masculine, or androgyne, and is made to symbolize water, the great deep, and its origin. It is mystic in all the languages, Eastern and Western, and stands as a glyph for the waves. Thus, thus in the Aryan esotericism, as in the Semitic, this letter has always stood for the waters. In Sanskrit, Makara, the tenth sign of the zodiac, means a crocodile, or rather an aquatic monster, associated always with the water. The letter Ma is equivalent to and corresponds with the number five, composed of a binary, the symbol of the two sexes separated, and of the ternary, the symbol of the third life, the progeny of the binary. This again is often symbolized by a pentagon or pentagram, and the latter being a sacred sign as a divine monogram. Maitreya is a secret name of the fifth Buddha and the Koki avatar of the Brahmins, the last messiah who will come at the culmination of the great cycle. It is also the initial letter of the Greek metis or divine wisdom of Mimra or quote the word end quote or logos and of Michas, Michar and monad and mystery. All these are born in and from the great deep and are the sons of Maya, the mother in Egypt, mouth in Greece, Minerva, divine wisdom, Mary or Miriam, Mira, etc., of the mother of the Christian Logos and of Maya, the mother of Buddha, Madhava and Madhavai are the titles of the most important gods and goddesses of the Hindu pantheon. The Egyptian Lotus. And finally, Mandala. It is in Sanskrit, quote, a circle, end quote, or an orb, the ten divisions of the Rig Veda. The most sacred names in India begin with this letter, generally from Mahat, the first manifested intellect, and Mandara great mountain used by the gods to churn the ocean, down to Mandakin, the heavenly Ganja, or Ganges, Manu, etc., etc. And shall all this be called a coincidence? A strange one it is then indeed, when we find even Moses found in the water of the Nile, having a symbolical consonant in his name, and the Pharaoh's daughter, quote, called his name Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water, end quote, Exodus 2.10. Besides which, the Hebrew sacred name of God applied to this letter, M, is Mavrak, or holy, or blessed, and the name of the water of the flood is Mbul. Footnote, even to the seven daughters of the Midian priest, who coming to draw the water, had Moses water their flock, for which service the Midian gives to Moses Zipporah, Zipporah, which means the shining wave, as a wife, Exodus 2. All this has the same secret meaning. End of footnote. A reminder of the, quote, three Marys, end quote, at the crucifixion, and their connection with Mar, the sea or water, may close this example. This is why in Judaism and Christianity, the Messiah is always connected with water, baptism, the fishes, the sign of the zodiac called Minam, 
in Sanskrit, and even with the Matsaya fish avatar and the lotus, the symbol of the womb or the water lily, which is all the same. In the relics of ancient Egypt, the greater the antiquity of the votive symbols and emblems of the objects exhumed, the oftener are the lotus flowers and the water found in connection with solar gods. The god Nun, the moist power water, as Thales taught it, being the principle of all things, sits on a throne enshrined in a lotus. The god Bess stands on a lotus ready to devour his progeny. Thoth, the god of mystery and wisdom, the sacred scribe of Amenti wearing the solar disk as a headgear, then sits with a bull's head, the sacred bull of Mendes being a form of Thoth, and a human body on a full-blown lotus. And finally, it is the goddess Hiket, under her shape of a frog, who rests on the lotus, thus showing her connection with the water. It is this frog symbol, undeniably the most ancient of the Egyptian deities, from whose unpoetical shape the Egyptologists have been vainly trying to unravel her mystery and functions. Its adoption in the church by the early Christians shows that they knew it better than our modern Orientalists. The quote frog or toad goddess, end quote, was one of the chief cosmic deities connected with creation on account of her amphibious nature and chiefly because of her apparent resurrection after long ages of solitary life enshrined in old walls, rocks, etc. She has not only participated in the organization of the world together with Hnum, but was also connected with the dogma of resurrection. Footnote, with the Egyptians, it was the resurrection and rebirth after 3,000 years of purification, either in Devakan or in the, quote, fields of the bliss, end quote, end of footnote. There must have been some very profound and sacred meaning attached to this symbol, since notwithstanding the risk of being charged with a disgusting form of zoolatry, the early Egyptian Christians adopted it into their churches. A frog or a toad enshrined in a lotus flower, or just simply without the latter emblem, was the form chosen for the church lamps on which were engraved the words, Ego Emni Anastasis, or, quote, I am the resurrection, end quote.